them and see how they answer it. And you'll find they really, it's usually something they've heard from somebody else who heard it from somebody else who heard it from somebody else. They've never actually picked the Bible up to read it at all. So the word of God is very prevalent, it revelant, revelant to us today. Uh, it's most important. We, it's needed. Uh, the word of God is, is awesome. Amen? Pray with me, please. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us the manual for life, Lord. The keys to how to live our life in glorifying and magnifying you, Lord, to exalt you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being our God and our King. Thank you, Lord, that you still reign, that you're sitting on the throne, that you are very relevant, Lord. Father, as we dig into your word tonight, I pray that you would be with us, Lord. Help me to bring forth your word in a way that's understandable. Give us ears to hear and heart to receive. Bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are in Exodus chapter 1. When we left off, we left off with Pharaoh and his plan to reduce the Hebrew population by putting them under forced labor and task masters. And as we saw, that plan was a complete failure. For the more he afflicted them, the more they continued to multiply. Worried and not thinking clearly, in my opinion, Pharaoh had to come up with another way, not only to keep the Israelite population under control, but in fact to reduce it. Remember that God is working out his plan of getting his people out of Egypt. They have become complacent during those, their long stay in Egypt. Returning to Canaan was something that was so long ago and so far away. As far as they were concerned right now, Egypt, despite what was going on with them and the hard labor and the slavery, Egypt was home. 400 years. 400 years they had been in Egypt. God's goal then included more than simply getting his people out of Egypt. He wanted to get Egypt out of his people. Luke underscored this truth in Acts chapter 7, verse 39, when Stephen, in recounting the Exodus and the events thereafter, said in their hearts the Israelites turned back to Egypt. Even after leaving Egypt, Israel faced the temptation of, turn, of turning back and turning their back on God. And we'll talk more about that as we get deeper into our study. But for those of us who have read ahead, we already know where the heart of the people were as they were making their journey. So this is where we can pick up our study for tonight. We're in Exodus chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. So plan B. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra, and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birthing stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. Let's stop there. So if at first you don't succeed, try, try again might have been in Pharaoh's mind. His first plan to control the Hebrew population didn't succeed. So he comes up with plan B. Pharaoh seems to be governed more by his fear than common sense. His new plan is to have the Hebrew midwives kill all the male newborn babies upon delivery. The birthing stool that is spoken of was not actually a stool. It was an Egyptian innovation in childbirth. Women would give birth standing up rather than lying down. They crouched over two stones or bricks and pushed down on the stones, sort of like mm, pushing down for leverage. The pushing and the laws of gravity helped the baby slide down the birth canal. Bethany's laughing because she knows that 
When I joined the center, I've learned more about the women's e reproductive system than I ever wanted to know. One of the downfalls of a man working at the pregnancy center. But, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's, it's something that we have to know. But the women, they, they caught, the midwives would catch the baby before they hit the ground. Now, we shouldn't expect that these two women were the only midwives for the children of Israel. They were probably the leaders of some association of midwives. If Pharaoh's plan succeeded, by one generation, they could destroy the children of Israel. Now, for those of us who were involved with the pregnancy center, this all sounds kind of familiar. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Yes, this was Pharaoh's plan, and he was responsible for his actions. But behind the scenes was Satan and his demonic forces trying once again to prevent the Messiah, the seed of the woman, from coming. One writer puts it like this, quote, If this plan had succeeded, Pharaoh would have wiped out the Hebrew people. The future generation of men would be dead, and the girls would, be eventually, would eventually be married to Egyptian slaves and absorbed into the Egyptian race, end quote. But here's the thing. God's plan will not fail, and he will use the wickedness of man to fulfill his will. We may see the command of Pharaoh as consistent with Satan's plan of Jew hatred through the century as an attack on God's Messiah and ultimately his ultimate plan for Israel in his plan of redemption. Satan knew that the Messiah, the seed of the woman, the one who would crush his head, would come from the children of Israel. Therefore, he tried to destroy the whole nation in one generation by ordering all the male children to be killed. So what he was doing, he was initiating a state-sponsored plan of genocide that demanded the killing of all the male Hebrew babies. Again, how many generations have we killed off so far with abortion? But this reminds us of the deliverer who survived the ruthless, ruthlessness of another dictator. Just as Moses lived in the spirit, in spite of the genocide, so Jesus lived through the baby killing leadership of Herod. Remember that? But think about the parents. The parents during that time, the parents must have lived in constant terror. Think about it. Nine months of dread and worry. Remember? Ultrasound didn't exist back then. On delivery day, to hear that announcement, it's a boy, must have devastated the parents. Just think about it, Linda. You couldn't have said anything. Nothing. Again, it was seen that Pharaoh was governed by his fear. However, from the outset, it's pretty clear that this plan had no chance of succeeding. When it came, became public knowledge, surely the women would just do without the service of the midwives, right? Hey, they're going to kill them. I'm not having a midwife come in. Call your next door neighbor, anybody to come help you, but not a midwife. Verse 17, but the midwives feared God and didn't do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. Stop there. Now, this is the first instance in scripture of what today we call civil disobedience, refusing to obey an evil law because of an higher good. These midwives probably feared Pharaoh and his power but they feared God more. For them, the choice was clear. The civil government commanded something that was clearly against God's command. The midwives did the only thing, the only right thing that they could do. They obeyed God rather than man. When the laws of God are contrary to the laws of men, then we ought to obey who? the laws of God rather than man. They acted on the same principles as did the persecuted apostles in Acts chapter 4 
when Peter asked the civil authorities whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God. You judge. Though generally we are called to obey the government and honor civil authorities, we are never called to put government in the place of God. Therefore, if the government tells us to do something against God's will, we are to obey God first. Douglas makes this observation, quote, The story of the midwives is a story of heroic resistance. So noteworthy were their, <coughs> excuse me, so noteworthy were their, were their, was their courage that their personal names are recorded in contrast to any of the elders of Israel, even the Pharaoh. These two midwives' names, along with the names of Jacob's children and Moses' family, are the only names actually mentioned in the early chapters of the book, end quote. And that's true. McKay writes, quote, It reveals the attitude of Moses as he wrote this, that the names of these two women who were of insignificant rank are recorded while the pharaohs are left nameless, end quote. These two women took a stand for what was right before their God, to obey God or man. For these two women, there was only one choice, only one right thing to do. Also, in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 20, uh, 29, as Peter and the other apostles were arrested for their faith, we are told, quote, and when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intended to bring these, this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than man, end quote. The government can't stop us from sharing our faith. Fear at times can make people do foolish things with no thought of what the real outcome will be. Overall, the policy seems to be a measure of desperation. How could it be expected that it would remain a secret? How do you think this would remain a secret? Again, once it became public knowledge, surely the women would simply not call the midwives. These women had a true respect and reverence for God, which led them to do what was right in the sight of God. These women had a grasp of the sanctity of life as a divine gift and were not prepared to act contrary to their conscience, no matter what political pressure they came under. They were going to obey the Lord. They were going to obey the Lord. Again, McKay writes, quote, the state in the form of the tyrant Pharaoh had resorted to having helpless infants slaughtered to further his purpose, but they would not be parties to it. The midwives were not national leaders. They did not seek leadership roles in the community, but their quiet and principle, their quiet and principle resistance forced the cruelty of the tyrant, end quote. They stood up for what they believed. They stood up for what was right. They stood up for their God. One of the things that led me to take the job at the pregnancy center was the ladies, the women that I work with, who are taking a stand. For they know, for something they know is not popular, especially right now in our, in our society right now. What's the hot, hot topic in the election coming up? Abortion. Abortion rights. Yet these ladies have taken a stand. And they do a job, and they do it well. And it's something that I admire them for. It's something that makes me scratch my head because I don't know how they don't walk out of that place crying every single day with the stories and the situations that they face. And yet they come to work with the joy of the Lord in their hearts and the desire to do their job 
to save the lives of babies. To miss one baby is not acceptable to them. But the joyous time that we have in the prayer room upstairs when we hear that someone has changed their mind, but not only changed their mind, they've given their heart to the Lord. Isn't it awesome? Now, after some time, Pharaoh could not help but notice that his instructions had not been carried out. So, verse 18, so the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Let's stop there. Now, remember, this is Pharaoh. His power was absolute in the land. And it was no trivial matter to be summoned before a dissatisfied Pharaoh. But these women, they maintained their composure. Pharaoh was very clear in what he wanted the midwives to do. And now it was clear to him that his orders had not been carried out. And he wanted to know why. They were literally caught up on the carpet. Their answer was pretty straightforward. Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. Hebrew wives deliver so quickly that before the midwives could arrive, the babies would already be delivered. Once the midwives arrived, the baby boys, did they hide the baby boys? What happened? Did the parents lie about the sex of the baby when the midwives arrived? And from what, we, from what we know about these midwives, did they really pursue the matter? I mean, were they really going to pursue it? What was your baby? Um, it's a girl. They don't know. Okay, okay. They're just going about their business. McKay writes again, quote, there must have been significant truth in their reply for Pharaoh to remain silent. Civil government has no right to command or comply or to compel, excuse me, anything contrary to the law of God. It is too, it too is answerable to God and its fear of legitimate actions is limited by him. When the actions of political power run contrary to the requirements of God's word, we must refuse to comply. End quote. Now the question becomes, did these women lie? Were they lying? Were they lying in their answer to Pharaoh? The other question could be, should we ever lie? Are there situations where we would lie to save a life? Would God accept our lies? Were the midwives lying to Pharaoh? Well, where do we find the answer for that? The word of God, right? Proverbs 6.16 says this, These six things the Lord hates, yes, even seven, are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, heads that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives wicked, that advises wicked plans, feet that are swift to run to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. The Bible is clear that lying is a sin, and it is pleasing to God. The first sin this world, in this world involved a lie told to Eve. The Ten Commandments given to Moses includes, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Colossians chapter 3 verse 9 says, Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices. Furthermore, liars will be among those judged in the end, says Revelation 21.8. In contrast, God never lies, says Titus 1.2. He is the source of truth, 
It is impossible for God to lie, says Numbers 23, 19. So, should we lie? I think the answer is pretty clear. But I don't believe that these women were lying. First, I believe that, as I said, this wasn't a plan that was well thought out. If you were an expecting mother and the word had gotten out that this was the order of the day, would you call a midwife that was going to carry out that order? Second, these two women could have leaked the word and given orders to their subordinates to show up late, giving the mothers time to give birth. Third, perhaps indeed the Hebrew women were healthier than the Egyptian women, yet the midwives did not explain all the reasons why the babies were spared. Poole writes, quote, This might be no lie, as many suppose, but a truth concerning many of them, and they do not affirm it to be so with all. So here was, noth so here was nothing but the truth, though they did not speak the whole truth, which they were not obligated to do, end quote. Cole writes, Quote, we are not told whether the midwives were lying or whether the quick delivery of Hebrew babies was a biological fact. Even if they lie, it is not for their deceit that they were commanded, commended, but for their refusal to take the infant's lives. End quote. Even if the midwives deceived Pharaoh, that was not what God, why God blessed them. He blessed their godly behavior in obeying him before man. The most amazing thing about this is that the more they tried to derail God's plan to multiply the children of Israel in Egypt, the more God made sure that his plan succeeded. Isn't that awesome? That is our God. That's our God. That should give us great hope and encouragement in who he is and what he can do. This is a wonderful example of the goodness and power of God. Pharaoh said less, God said more. Pharaoh said stop, God said go. That's our God. David Guzik writes, quote, If the battle were just between Pharaoh and the people of Israel, Pharaoh would have clearly won. But the real battle included God in the equation, and that changed everything. God obviously won this battle, but he won his victory through some courageous individuals who were willing to stand up to the power of Pharaoh and do what was right, end quote, i.e., my sisters at the, at the clinic. It's something to watch. Unfortunately, one of the things we are bound by is to not share stories. We can't, we are bound by secrecy not to reveal people's personal information. But we get generalities and, and we can rejoice with those when, they, when we hear of how our baby has been saved. Question, why didn't Pharaoh punish these two women? We should be reading about them being taken and executed for disobeying Pharaoh's orders. Why weren't they taken out and off with their heads? Come on, guys, we know the answer to that. God and his providence ensured that Pharaoh didn't harm the midwives. Not only that, but as we see in the next verses, verse 20, Therefore God did lot, dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. Not only did God protect them, but he blessed them. Again, the evidence of all the loving and grace and mercy of our God, of who he is. We know that this Pharaoh neither feared God nor man. In other words, he wasn't a very nice man. So why didn't he take actions against um, Shiphrah and Puah? 
It was through it was through God's control of this situation that there was no follow up on Pharaoh's part to inquire. He didn't he didn't go any further with their after their answer. God and His providence ensured that um, the Pharaoh did not harm these these women. God had them in the palm of His hand. He had them in the palm of His hand. It is said that women became midwives because they didn't have families of their own. So what would be a suitable reward for these two brave, God-fearing women? Of course, God blessed these two women with families of their own. And these two women lived up to their name. Shifra means beautiful one, and Pua means splendid one. And I say amen to that. One commentator writes, quote, we should remember that these women did something for us. Because they rescued the babies, we will be raised from the dead. How so? If you do not have these women, you do not have Moses, the Exodus, David, Moses, or Jesus. The women were so important that Moses even mentioned them by name, yet you do not see the name of Pharaoh anywhere in the text. Pharaoh means great house, just as White House personifies the U.S. president. Pharaohs want their names remembered. They built pyramids to be remembered. Yet the only names remembered are those who fear God and protect life, end quote. So, with plans A and B being complete failures, Pharaoh comes up with his ultimate and most wicked of all plans. Verse 22. So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter they shall save alive. At this point, the program plan reaches its final stage. There was no more subterfuge, no limitations on involvement. All Egyptians were expected to join in killing all Israelites' newborn boys. Everyone. The process of persecution that had begun modestly had escalated in steps and reached its zenith. A full-blown, open national policy of large-scale genocide against a particular ethnic group had begun. McKay writes, quote, It was no longer a secret policy to be carried out quietly by a few. Now now all Egypt knew and were involved. The guilt of complicity is spread throughout all the Egyptians, and all will be involved in the judgmental catastrophe, which will be its ultimate consequences, end quote. Now, why throw the babies into the Nile? Why not just kill them with knives or rocks or throw them on the ground? Why not? Well, there are two good reasons why the Egyptian pharaoh would have suggested this approach. First, it was a convenient and clean sort of a way to kill infants. Isn't that just like really gross? Looking for, let's find a clean, easy way to just get rid of all the babies. Again, sounds very familiar. When you read and learn about abortions, you read that it's, that, you know, you go there, you go to the doctor, you get it done, it's over with. Your hands are clean. It's all over. And we know that that's not true. There's long and far-reaching effects. It was convenient in that virtually the entire population of Egypt lived essentially on the banks of the Nile, while it was a source of water as well as a convenience a convenience for sewage, for the mighty current took away the waste. Wow. Wow. How heartless. Wait a minute. We're kind of doing something like that now, right? Being as heartless. Throwing a baby into denial was a lot easier and quicker, invol- quicker, involving no cleanup and leaving no evidence than almost any other means of killing. 
the child would simply fall into the water and disappear out of sight and hopefully, from the Egyptians' point of view, out of mind. Second, denial was viewed as a god. So this shifted the blame. Egyptians viewed the Nile as a, grip, as a giver and taker of life. Thus, they might have thought they were doing the will of their gods. If the Nile were to take a baby's life, that was the Nile's decision, wasn't it? Wow. We haven't come far from that, have we? Stuart writes, quote, while the narrative is appropriately trusted in this point, it is easy to imagine that Pharaoh's messenger in bringing his command to the people were instructed to inform them that by throwing babies into the Nile, they were doing the will of God, of their gods, and giving the Nile its proper due among the gods. Just tell the people they're pleasing their gods, the Nile God. That way you soothe their conscience. They'll be all right. But there is an irony that follows from this approach to killing the Israelite boys, um, baby boys. Later, God will kill large numbers of grown-up boys, that is, Egyptian soldiers, by drowning them in the Red Sea, end quote. One commentator writes, quote, In seeing this, we should recognize a biblical pattern. God takes a place of death and turns it into a place of life and salvation. Think about Noah and the flood, Jonah and the fish, the Red Sea and God's people, and how Jesus' tomb became the place of life. All of these stories point to God's divine power to take death and bring life, end quote. What Pharaoh doesn't know yet is that his plan is once again doomed to fail. It is his plan that will bring to life the deliverer of Israel. One commentator writes, quote, the very policy that Pharaoh thought would dim diminish or exterminate the Israelites was overturned by God to become the channel by which would raise up and equip the deliverer through whom he would set his people free, end quote. His plan had no chance of succeeding, none. While we don't know the number of people who obeyed Pharaoh's command, in chapter 2, we'll see one woman who didn't. McKay writes, quote, The book of Exodus has as one of its themes getting to know God and learning how to live in a way that pleases him. In this first chapter, it presents us with a situation where God Presence, where God's presence is not immediately evident. Indeed, the skies are dark and threatening. His people are under threat, but it is not a threat that catches God unaware. It has been a long, long foretold and is part of the structure he has imposed on the history of this world. Through this, he teaches his people to rely upon him for the victory. But there is also a present presence to us here in the first chapter of Exodus, the record of how two ordinary women acted, as a time, acted at a time of oppression and coercion. They knew what they believed in and were prepared to stand up to the cruelty of an oppressive state no matter what it cost them. They would not be, they would not be false to their beliefs and oppose the ethnic cleansing of this tyrant. Their quiet resistance remains an example to all when it comes to a choice between obeying human authorities and obeying God. Furthermore, we see here more than an instance of attempted genocide per perpetuated by an ancient ruler. This is part of the ongoing battle that has, has structured all human history since the fall of mankind. In Eden, the Lord God had announced to Satan, I will put enmity, enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike at his heel. In, attempt, in attempting to eliminate the offspring of the woman, the chosen people of God, Pharaoh and all Egypt with him 
are acting as Satan's pawns, and their murderous scheme will not achieve their end. Such oppression did not cease when Israel left Egypt. There have been many times when God has seemed unmindful of his people's suffering, and evil has had the upper hand. Nowhere is this more evident than in the darkness of the cross, when Christ cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then the assault of the kingdom of darkness reaches their peak against him who is supremely the offspring of the woman, but they did not win the day. Though Christ has achieved a divisive victory over sin and Satan, demonic antagonism is permitted to continue and trouble and hardship and persecution remain for the people of God. But the triumph over them is already assured in Christ. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Paul can go on to assure the believers at Rome and with them, the church down through the ages, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. When God does intervene, his glory shines all the more brightly against the somber canvas of his people's tribulations, end quote. God's going to win, guys. God's already won the battle. The battle has already been won. God continues to be concerned for physical freedom and especially spiritual freedom. Wright says, quote, although Exodus stands as a unique and unrepeatable event in the history of Israel, it also stands as an example in a highly repeatable way God wishes to act in the world and ultimately will act for the whole, the whole of creation, end quote. The killing of babies is still, unfortunately, going on to this very day. There were 1,026,700 abortions performed in 2023. That's the highest number in over a decade. The last time there were, have been over a million abortions provided in the U.S. was 2012. Now, I'm not going to do a teaching or expound on the subject of abortion. Dave did a very detailed teaching on it back in January of last year. I looked it up, and it's on our website. If you want to see it and listen to it, I advise you to do so. Nevertheless, we are still fighting that battle. Five days a week for us in Woodbridge and Manassas and centers all over the country, pregnancy centers are fighting the fight to save babies' lives. This church, your pastors, support, highly support that ministry. And make no mistake about it, guys. Care First, Life First is a ministry. It is a ministry because the gospel is shared with every single client and patient that comes in the door. Every single one of them. So it's not just about saving babies, it's about saving souls too. And we covet your prayers. We covet your prayers. Pray for us. Pray for our protection because the enemy is out to get us as well. He's aware. Next, we go to chapter two. But before that, I'm going to end with a commercial. I'm going to end with a commercial. For those of you who are sitting here and those of you who are on the Internet, Three weeks ago, Pastor Dave did a teaching on quiet time. If you are struggling with your quiet time, I encourage you, highly encourage you, to go and listen to that message. Your quiet time is important. Don't take it for granted. If you're having a problem with it, go listen to the message. If you're here, speak to Dave or I about helping you establish a quiet time. On Sunday, Pastor Dave also preached a message on evangelism. If you are afraid or do not know how to share your faith openly and with confidence, again, go listen to Sunday's message. Go out 
when they go out on Sundays out to Old Town Manassas to the train station and learn. Learn how to share your faith. It is so important. It is so important. Let's all stand. Colette's not here tonight, but you know what, guys? I love being saved. I love being saved. The things I get to do, the people I get to meet, the awesome people I get to work with. By the way, you guys know the real boss of the pregnancy center is Phoebe, right? She is the real boss. But God is great. God gives you opportunities to go out and share your faith. God gives you opportunities to spend time with him, to get to know him, to draw closer to him. Our part of the bargain is to partake, to partake. Is God calling you to go and share your faith with someone? Is God calling you to get involved? Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy and love. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord that there is nothing new under the sun, Lord. And Lord, we need your guidance. We need your strength. We need your direction, Lord, to continue to combat the evil and wickedness of this world. But Lord, we know that we don't stand alone because we have you, our great God, our great King. Father, I pray you would see us safely home until we come together again. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.